Morning, church. I'm Ben. I'm going to be reading the Bible for us from Galatians chapter 6, verse 11 to 18. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised, that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Bless you. Lovely to see you on this lovely, cool morning. Great to be together. Let me just pray. Lord, we just thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for your word. We thank you that we have it. We can read it. We can study it. We can know it. We can remember it. We thank you for the power that it has in our lives to transform us. We seek your spirit to be our teacher today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning I want to speak from this uh, latter half of Galatians 6 about Christian identity. And the thing I want to say is that our identity in Christ is the thing that matters most about us. Our identity in Christ, it's the thing that matters most about us. Uh, It's so much a matter of joy for me to be here today and to be able to share from the scriptures. I'm always happy to be here at Harborside, happy to be here in my home church, happy to share the life of Harborside Church. It's always a blessing. But I'm often called away to ministry in other churches. And uh, of course, while I'm glad to do that, it takes me away from you and it takes me away from our gatherings and That's always a cost and a loss for me. So if on a Sunday you're looking around to try and find me and you can't see me, then just pray for me. It means I'm somewhere else ministering to other people and I'd be always glad of your prayers, uh, praying that the Lord will give me the gift I need for that day, for those people in that place, in that time. I'd be very grateful for that. But today it's my pleasure to be here and this morning I want to say something helpful about Christian identity from Galatians chapter 6. The language of identity has become kind of commonplace in recent years. I was filling in a form recently, I forget what it was for, but it asked me if I identified as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, or if I identified as disabled, or if I identified as a refugee. Uh, Once you would have been asked, are you disabled? Are you a refugee? But this questionnaire uh, recognises that Identity is not just a kind of objective thing, it's a thing we decide about ourselves, that we choose about ourselves. Do you identify as, a, as disabled? That's, that's a broader question, isn't it, than are you disabled? Um, now, I know we Christians sometimes get a bit troubled about how this type of language is used to speak about gender identities and sexual identities and so forth. But I think it's true that this language helps us to say important things about our Christian faith because when we become Christians, one of the things that happens is that we choose, as it were, to identify with Christ. The language of identity helps us to speak about that. We once identified ourselves with other things, poor patrol perhaps, or, or you know, with sports teams or other things, but now we identify with Christ. We have and we share a Christian identity. And so this morning I want to teach that our identity in Christ is the thing that matters most about us. It's true of us as a community, corporately. It's true of us individually. It certainly was true for Paul, The Apostle Paul, and it's what he wanted to encourage the believers in Galatia to know about themselves, that our identity in Christ is the thing that matters most about us. Now, our identity has two dimensions. When we claim to have a certain identity, it's to assert something about ourselves individually. If, for example, I say that I identify as an Australian, then I'm saying that 
My heritage in the nation, my participation in it is a very important part of me. So that's about me individually. But our identity also links us with something outside ourselves. It links us with something that exists independently of ourselves. And that's the corporate dimension of identity. And so I want to think about this matter in these two dimensions, first corporately and then individually. And why Galatians? Well, I have a pattern of studying the Scripture, especially the New Testament, and making a major study of a particular book at a particular time. And in the moment, I'm halfway through a kind of serious study of the book of Galatians. So I wanted to bring something fresh uh, out of that study for you. Um, I hope I can just share a little bit with you. Now, you may not be aware that this little six-chapter letter, Paul to Galatians, played a very important role in what was called the Reformation. Reformation happened 500 years ago, and it caused a very great split in the church, resulting in two great Christian camps, the Roman Catholics on one side and the Protestants on the other. Um, and these two have become more or less Christian identities, two tribes. Now, we are Baptists. We are in the Protestant tribe on that big split. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. And as a result of being in that side, we have a traditional way of reading Galatians. And I'll explain that in a moment. Um, but I want to just sort of kind of alert you to the fact that I want to draw the point in a few minutes that really that was a sad mistake arising from a misreading of Galatians. So that's kind of the troubled territory we're going to walk in in a few minutes. I want to put that round in a positive way, broadly speaking, to say that our identity in Christ is the thing that matters most about us. So let's think about this corporately and let's turn our attention then to Galatians chapter 6. I think it'll come up behind me, but if you have a Bible, it will be helpful for you to take a look at that. We're in the latter half of the chapter 6, and uh, Paul is writing in this letter to the believers in the region of Galatia, which is in modern-day Turkey. He himself was the first to evangelize this area, and he's deeply attached to the believers there and to the churches in that region. And he's deeply disturbed, deeply concerned that shortly after he left the region, other teachers arrived teaching a different gospel. And so in chapter 1, verse 6, we read this, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. And specifically, um, they came. these teachers came teaching that these non-Jewish Christians had to get circumcised in the Jewish way. Now, I know it's kind of a weird thing to be talking about circumcision. And for the most part, mercifully, we don't have to talk about that. But here it is in the scriptures, and so we do have to deal with that circumcision. There were Jewish Christians coming to the churches in Galatia and saying that these non-Jewish Christians needed to become Jewish. In other, and of course, circumcision of young boys was the identifying sign in the physical makeup of Jewish people. It marked them out in the flesh as Jews. It was an identity marker for them. It, it was the thing that defined a Jew was to have this procedure done on, on little boys when they were born. And these teachers came to the non-Jewish Christians and said, you've got to be circumcised. You've got to identify, therefore, as Jews. It's not good enough to be Christians. You have to identify as Jews. See, the question of identity is coming forward. In the language of identity, they needed to identify as Jews if they wanted to be Christians. You see the tangle there. And so Paul writes this passionate letter telling them that they need not be circumcised, that they don't need to take on a Jewish identity. Instead, what they needed to know is that their Christian identity is enough for them. It's more than enough. It's the most important thing about them. And that's why he comes back to this subject in the very last section in chapter 6. 
And so I'm just picking it up in chapter 6 where he says, See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. You know, it was Paul's custom to dictate his letters. He would always have a scribe, somebody with a stylus who would be writing the message and Paul would dictate it. But it was also his custom at the end of that process to take the pen himself and write the last few lines. He did it routinely, and here is what he's doing. And that's why he begins by saying, see with what large letters I write. This is my writing. This is recognizably me. It was a way of authenticating the letter. Uh, And then having done that, um, he then says, those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. This is the main theme of the letter. It's a theme which includes strong criticism of the people who've been teaching the Galatians they need to be circumcised. And from this summary criticism, we discover a lot about the motivation of these teachers. Evidently, they're trying to force the Galatians to get circumcised for two reasons. First, they want to impress someone. They want to make a good impression outwardly. And he says it a second time in verse 12, they want to boast about your flesh. And if we ask why they wanted to achieve this, we find the second reason is that they want to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. So they want to be able to reassure somebody somewhere that these non-Jewish Christians are identifying as Jews and they think that by doing that they will avoid persecution. We don't know who these people are. We don't really know who these agitators, these troublemakers, these false teachers. We don't really know who they are. They may have been traditional Jews uh, in Jerusalem who needed to be reassured that the Christians were still within the the Jewish fold. They may have been Jewish Christians still unsure about how non-Jewish Gentiles should be included in the church. Or they may be actually the Roman authorities themselves We don't really know. All we know is that these false teachers, these agitators, um, want to impress them and so to avoid persecution. And so what we can gather from that is, I know that's a bit complicated, you don't need the detail really. What we can gather from that is that these were Christians responding to a socio-political threat. And what that means is that they were not teaching another way to please God. They were not teaching another way to be saved. They were not teaching another way to get to heaven. They were not adding works to faith. They were causing trouble, that's for sure, but they were not teaching a new way to be saved. And what that means is that the reformers misunderstood Galatians. The reformers, 500 years ago, read Galatians like this. These false teachers were trying to add works to faith They were insisting that the young Galatians believers had to obey Jewish law in order to be justified, in order to be put right with God. And against this false gospel, Paul was teaching that they didn't have to obey the law. They only had to believe. And that Christians are justified by faith and not by works. We're saved not by what we do, but what we believe. But this little section of Galatians makes it clear that these pro-circumcision people were not teaching another way to get saved. They were teaching that Christians had to identify as Jews so that the church would not be persecuted. And now with that in mind, see how Paul summarizes his view of this in verse 15. He says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is new creation. What counts is new creation. New creation. There was an old creation. We read about that in Genesis. This is new creation. God recreating the world. It's what Jesus refers to as the renewal of all things. 
It's what Peter refers to as the restoration of all things. It's what Paul elsewhere refers to as the reconciliation of all things. God's great plan, God's great purpose to renew, restore, recreate the world. That's what matters. That shifts our gaze. That turns our attention to a different subject, a different focus. Now, to help understand the point that Paul is making, it will help if we track back in Galatians to the two other places where Paul makes the same basic point. And so in chapter 5, verse 6, what we read there is, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Circumcision has no value, but then neither does uncircumcision. Neither of them matter. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Actually, the Greek reads faith working through love. Faith working, drawing together two concepts which the reformers separated. But here Paul says the only thing that counts is faith working Faith working through love. How does faith work through love? It does it in a community. Faith creating a community of people where love is the main distinctive, where human beings are valued, where human needs are taken seriously, where people are respected and served and treasured. So what matters is not circumcision. This is what Paul is saying. But God's new creation And the advanced sign in the world of this new creation are communities where faith works through love. New communities characterized by love between one and another. It's reminiscent of what Jesus said, isn't it? They shall know you by your love. That's how you know that this is real. It's the love that is shown between the members of the body. And now look at chapter 3, verse 26 and 28. Paul says it the first time in a slightly different way. So we're now in chapter 3 and reading from 26 where he says, You are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. Christ. So none of the identities of the ancient world count for anything among the Christians. It's not that they're extinguished. They just don't mean anything anymore. And in their place is a new identity. You are all one in Christ. And here then is the unifying identity of this new creation community, this new faith working through love community. We are those who are in Christ. And if we ask, well, how do we come to share this new identity? Paul kind of runs through the list in verse 26. You are children of God through faith in Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, you have clothed yourself in Christ. So there's the sequence, faith in Christ, expressed in baptism in the name of Christ and leading to a transformed life, being renewed, putting on Christ and living the life of Christ in the world. And so our identity with Christ, this is the point that Paul is making, has become for us the thing that matters most for us Corporately, All the other identities count for nothing. What matters is that we are in Christ. I sometimes use the example of a wheel to illustrate this. Um, There are two essential things for the operation of a wheel. Hats off to the person who invented a wheel. I mean, that was a clever guy, right? And the key to a wheel, the key to a wheel, I guess it happened over generations of discovering that the key thing for a wheel is it's got to be round, right? It's got to be round. That's a brilliant idea. The thing has got to be round. And uh, if it's nearly round, you've got a problem. If you had a ridden a bike where a couple of spokes are missing, what do you get? A flat spot. 
And then the ride is good, 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 isn't it? It's bumpy, it's awkward, it's kind of distressing, it's difficult. The wheel doesn't work because the wheel isn't round. But there's another way a wheel will fail. Even if it is perfectly round, it will fail if the axis is not in the middle. <laughs> then you get an even worse gudunk, 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 till the thing all falls apart. And it's the same with our understanding of our faith. The axis has to be at the centre. You know, churches can organise themselves around all kinds of centres, all kinds of axes. In terms of Galatians, we could be, for example, the male church. Now, I know that sounds bizarre, given that there are always more women than men in churches, but churches can be male, masculine. They can, their calling card can be a kind of robust masculinity segueing into a violent masculinity. That's a real thing in our church, in our world. Or it could be a female church, and there are plenty of churches that are very much female-dominated. We are the female church, which would make us the gentle, spirited, touchy-feely church, male churches, female churches. Or we could be the slave church. You know, we need liberation. Or it could be the master church. It's about maintaining the system so that, the, uh, so that it works for our benefit. But Paul's saying any one of those alternate identities, and there are thousands more we could discuss, would be off-center and they would count for nothing. They would mean something. And in fact, compared to those who are in Christ, they don't even exist. They are so pointless. In our day, we could be the traditional Orthodox church. You know, we sing all the old hymns, we use the prayer book, we wear our suits, we're the traditional church, the original and the best, you know, that kind of idea. We could be that kind of church, or we could be the groovy young thing church with our groovy outfits and our techno something, 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 (laughs) whatever it is, you know, our up to the minute. We can be that church with that identity. We could be that. I hear somebody say we are that. (laughs) I hope we are not quite that. We can also be the Reformed Church. The Reformed Church. The Reformed Church, then you get to be the we are right and they are wrong church. You get get to look at all the other believers in the world and you go, we are right and they are wrong. And it feels good to be right when everybody else is wrong. Priding yourself. Priding ourselves that... We are somehow superior, we are somehow better, we somehow know better. Or we could be the Roman Catholic Church, you know, with our traditions going all the way back to the apostles. You know, we were here first. Uh, we, we go all the way back to the apostle Peter and we can look down our noses at those pesky Protestants with their kind of Bible reading opinions about everything. Think they are right. We could be any one of those churches with any one of those identities. And it's so real in our churches, churches building on identities, on things other than being in Christ. You know that old joke about the man who went to heaven and so Peter was leading him through, showing him around heaven and they walked alongside a very big wall and the man says to St. Peter, why is the big wall there? And Peter says, because it's the Presbyterians on the other side, they like to think they're the only ones here. And you could substitute just about any other denomination for that. Pentecostals, charismatic, you know, anyone other who like to think that we are the true church. We are the only ones that really count. To get the point, losing our center, losing our attachment to Christ, losing the center. I want to apply this positively now. King Jesus must be at the center of all that we do together. How did our Lord Jesus, how did he become Lord? How did he become Christ? He became Christ by his life and his death and his resurrection. This new creation we are part of began that Easter morning when the women came to the tomb and found it empty and then took the news of that to the disciples. The news of the resurrection. And in that resurrection, our Jesus from Nazareth became Lord and Christ And he became then the center of the Christian faith. The world has a new king and his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. 
And we are the people who believe that. And we are the people who have been baptised into that. And we are the people who seek to be clothed with that truth, to live it out in our lives day after day. We are the people called then to be a recreating presence in the world through love, through building communities of grace and love and through our testimony to this Christ. And one of the things you know, I really love about Harborside is that when we gather to worship, we never fail to come to the centre We never fail to confess the core of our faith. The core of our faith can be sung, it can be said, it can be shared in a hundred ways. And any way is a good way if it gives the Lord's people a chance to confess the crucified and risen Jesus is Lord and Christ. And if we get to stand together and point each other to the centre like spokes on a wheel, If we get to the centre ourselves in the confession of the Lordship of Jesus, that's a good thing, a great thing. The Spirit of God is at work. This is the real church. Hallelujah. I just want to say now a few words, though, for those whose task it is to select music for the church. Um, These days, the way we do church, we often give that task to somebody who is not theologically trained and maybe even doesn't hold pastoral responsibility for the life of the church. That's a mistake in my mind. But nonetheless, since we do it, here are three rules of thumb. If you have the responsibility of choosing worship, music in your church, here are three rules of thumb. The first is plural is better than singular. We is better than I. Us is better than me. Plural is better than singular. Make it about us, not about me. Second thing is objective is better than subjective. It's better to sing about God than to sing about ourselves. It's better to sing about God than it is to sing about ourselves. The third one is keep Christ at the center. Now, if I was conducting a service in this region and I had churches from every area, uh, from the the region, different denominations, and we were trying to choose a hymn, which hymn would we choose that every single church will know and sing? Amazing grace, wouldn't it? Like, that's a winner. Everyone will know amazing grace. Now, let's test it against this grid. Plural is better than singular. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like. Oh, gosh. Well, that's a. All right, well, that's a problem. Now, let's try objective versus subject. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now, oh, that's about me, isn't it? This song is all about me. Mm. And uh, where does Christ figure in this story? It's a story of a personal testimony in faith. Now, may every single believer have a personal testimony of the grace of God. May every one of us be able to say, I was lost and I was found. And the grace of God has reached me and changed my life. Hallelujah. May that be so. But that is not the center of Christian worship. That's you and your story. A good story may be, but not the center. The center is Christ. Sing a song about Christ. Keep Christ at the center. So our identity in Christ, that's the thing that matters most for us corporately, but it also is the thing that matters most for us individually. In this section of this message, I'm going to get a, I think I'm going to get upset, okay, so I'm just warning you. I, I've been a little bit controversial, a little bit, and now I'm going to get a little bit upset, okay, so uh, I'm sorry about that. It, it might not happen, I might skate over it, but it'll be there, I'll tell you, it's already there. Our identity in Christ is the thing that matters most to us individually. I want you to see how um, this, this question of identifying Christ corresponds to something deep within the believer, deep within us. And I want to show you how this works for Paul because it's right here on the page. See in verse 14, he says, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. These circumcision people, they want to boast about the fact that these Gentile Christians have embraced the Jewish identity by getting circumcised. Paul wants to boast, but only of the cross 
of Jesus. May I, may I never boast, he says. There's nothing in the world he wants to boast about. No quality, no success, no achievement, no personal attribute, no tribal characteristic. There's only one thing he wants to boast about, that he wants to take glory in, and that is the cross of Christ. There's only one thing I know he's saying in my life, which I feel happy to set before other people. And that is the cross of Christ. Think about that. Not even the, think about Paul's life. Think about his ministry. Think about all that he was involved in. He doesn't want to boast about his experience of the resurrection or of the miracles that were done through him nor the power of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't want to boast about the churches that he planted or the movements that he initiated. Only this, all he wants to boast of is the cross of Christ. And then see what he says about the cross in the second half of verse 14. Through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. These pro-circumcision people are trying to avoid persecution for the cross of Christ. They don't want people to think badly of them. But Paul is saying, I don't care about my reputation. I don't care what people think of me. And I know that if I speak of the cross of Christ, then I will be rejected and I will be persecuted. And that's okay because I'm a dead man anyway. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, I too died. And so my reputation means nothing to me so long as I can speak about Jesus and speak about his cross. Nothing else matters. And then see how deeply personal this is for Paul. See in verse 17, he says, Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. He speaks of the scars on his own body, his own misshapen and deformed body, the persecution he had already suffered so early in his ministry was evident in his body. The circumcision people want to take pride in the body, in the flesh, and Paul too is taking pride in his flesh, in his body. But for him, when he looks at his own battered body, what does he see? He sees the marks of Jesus. It's Jesus that occupies his mind and through which he sees his own body. His identity in Christ was the most important thing about him personally and individually. It ran to the very core of him. And so in the end, this is the criticism of the pro-circumcision people. In the end, what they're trying to do is avoid persecution. They want the world to look fondly on them and not take offense of them. But Paul is countering this with his teaching that genuine Christianity will be persecuted Christianity. Now, I know well that in our place, in our time, we experience very little outright persecution. And there's none of us, I'm sure, who can speak like Paul about the marks of Jesus in our body. But that doesn't mean Christian in this generation is without cost. And so this morning I want to acknowledge that for many of us gathered here this morning, holding true to our Lord has meant significant sacrifices. We've made decisions to live Christianly and that has cost us in important ways. We've given up on relationships and on jobs and on careers. We've given up on possibilities because we could not do so in Christian conscience. Many of us have sacrificed our financial position. We've discouraged romantic relationships. We've given up on treasured hopes and dreams and all this and more because we believe those choices were contrary to our Christian profession. And so this morning, dear brothers and sisters, I want to acknowledge these sacrifices and to commend you for making them. You may not bear the marks of Jesus in your body, but you bear them in your life. Choices you've made have shaped you and marked you. And I know well that we don't bear these things heroically. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to mention that, because I know that when we look back at the choices we made and 
But we find it hard to look back and say with hesi- without hesitation, I did that for my Lord. Instead, you know, we're riddled with doubt and with, we question our choices. We wonder if really, well, what was going I was just too scared or I was too selfish or I was too conscientious or I was too worried about other people's opinions. Choices we make are never pure, they're never simple. But even so, when the crunch came and we had to choose, we acted in Christian conscience and we did what we did for the Lord's sake. It cost us something significant. It changed the course of our lives and we bear in our lives the marks of Jesus because our identity in Christ was the most important thing about us. And so if that is speaking to you and the choices you have made, I want you to hear that the Lord, our Heavenly Father, sees what you have chosen. He sees what you did in secret and he will reward you. And this came home to me recently, um, just a couple of weeks ago in our anniversary service. And we were singing together um, a thousand hallelujahs. Uh, You know that beautiful song, praise to the Lord, to the Lamb, to the King of Heaven. Praise for He rose, now He reigns, and we will sing forever. And as I sang, I I I was feeling very emotional because I was aware that in that expression which we were sharing together, we were coming to the core of our faith. He rose and He reigns. He rose from the dead and He is Lord core of our Christian faith, praising the Lamb who was slain, who rose and now rules. And so in my mind, I knew that we were coming to the center and I was so glad that we were sharing this faith together. But then with that came also an awareness of all that it has cost me to live out that confession. (laughs) This is where it gets tricky. To love those who have hated me. To forgive when I have been wounded. To stay true to the Lord when there are other options. To hold fast to my profession because he is Lord and because he reigns. And on that day I was particularly aware of the cost that pastors bear in our service of the church. I was particularly conscious of the injustice we frequently experience, of the rejection we often suffer, of the contempt, and that is not too strong a word, the contempt with which we are held by folk who want to rival our leadership. And all of that, all of that just bubbled to the surface. I I struggled to keep on singing. I struggled. The air just kind of knocked out of my lungs by sadness and by pain. And then, and then, and then, below that, again, a pride. A pride. A pride because this is the pain of our Lord. These losses are the marks of Jesus in our lives and it was in my life. If the Lord suffered, we too must suffer. If we suffer like him, With him, we suffer for him. And in that suffering, we know him. And so we come to the center. Come to the center of ourselves. Come to the center of our faith. And we discover again our true identity. We discover again that our true identity, the most important thing to us, is our identity in Christ. So let me just apply this quickly. Brothers and sisters, we must therefore live in unity with our fellow believers. Whoever is willing to stand with us and declare that the Lamb who was slain and who rose from the dead and who now reigns, whoever is willing to share that faith and confess that faith is one of us. And we are one with them. And we must do that. We are compelled to do that for Christ's sake. Anything less than that diminishes Christ in our own lives and in the church. Now, our brothers and sisters from other traditions, they may look different to us. 
They may differ from us in significant ways. We may look across the divide between us and see a very different expression of our faith. We may look across and see things which seem to be unchristian to us. But we ought to remember that they are looking across the divide at us. <laughs> and they're wondering, are they genuinely believers or not? And they see things in our lives that seem sub-Christian to them. But if we hold a common confession of Jesus crucified and glorified, then we belong to one another and we need one another and we cannot live without each other. And Paul's point here is, in Galatians, is that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. What counts is new creation, is faith working through love, is being one in Christ. And so in our day, I think we need to say, there is neither Catholic nor Protestant, for we are all one in Christ. There is neither Evangelical or Pentecostal, for we are all one in Christ. There is neither Calvinist or Arminian, for we are all one in Christ. And so it is for Christ's sake that we must identify with our fellow believers for Christ's sake. And that's because he is the center, the core, the essence, the substance. And if we break fellowship for any reason other than our core confession of faith in Christ, then we are fracturing Christ's church. We are one in Christ. Christ, not two, not three, let alone thousands or tens of thousands. We are one in Christ. And that has to matter to us individually. If my faith in Christ lies at the core of me, then I will recognize it in others. I will celebrate it in others. I will rejoice when I find it in others. I will honor it when I discover it in others. And so I appeal to you, my dear friends, to welcome fellow believers into your life just as Christ welcomed you and put away that sectarian judgmentalism which allows us to treat fellow believers with disdain because they do not agree with us on everything. Your fellow believers, your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ need that from you. More than that, you need it. To keep yourself centered on Christ because your identity in Christ is the most important thing about you. And so the language of identity allows us to say some really important things about our Christian faith. There was a day when we accepted that Jesus rose from the dead and that he now reigns as Lord. And there was a day when we took that faith into ourselves in baptism and the life we live is now one of daily clothing ourselves with Christ, living and loving as he taught us to do. And so we came to identify with Christ. His death became ours. His suffering became ours. His life has become ours. We are his. He is ours. And so I just want to finish by asking, perhaps this morning you know you want to identify with Christ. It may be that as I've spoken in such a stark way, you feel stirred. And the thought of identifying with Jesus seems like a way forward in your life. It's captured your attention. And perhaps you realize today, I have never openly and publicly confessed my faith in Christ. Or perhaps you have a faith and you have not yet been baptized. Then let me encourage you. Come and talk to one of us. We can help you. More than that, we would be overjoyed to help you find your identity. The most important thing about you is your identity in our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless you guys. Thanks, thanks for that. I didn't get too upset in the end. <laughs> just, just a little bit. Uh, but I meant it. Bless you guys. <laughs>